Hello everybody, this is Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso and I have another tutorial for you today. I'm trying to get through the content as quickly as possible, but there's a lot of really cool things about it, so I don't know how quick it'll actually be. Not even recording a video intro this time, just to try and make it as fast as possible. Now, we are going to be tackling a bunch of different kind of polygon styles that we can create parametrically inside of Cinema. And here are just some possibilities I put together in like the last 45 minutes, and I'm probably just barely scratching the surface. The goal here is to show you a handful of different objects, some deformers, some modifiers inside of Cinema, and those become sort of these ingredients that you can build whatever you want. And the goal here is once you have those tools, you can visually make it stylistically the way you want to. It's also just really fun to play around with. Now. If you end up finding any of the content in this useful and you end up making some sort of render, please at me, at, at all the different things on Twitter, Instagram, everything. I would love to see it at Rocket Lasso. I'd really appreciate that. In addition to that, if you find this useful and you end up doing some sort of client work with it, or you make some, some mood boards or whatever the case may be, and you'd like to support me and creating this type of free content for everyone, I do have a Patreon set up. Support is appreciated, but not needed. These tutorials and the Rocket Lasso Live live stream will always be free for everyone. In this case, you would get access to some of the scene files, and I also have additional live streams where I record tutorials live in front of an audience. People's feedback influences the direction I might go with things. So support is appreciated, but again, not needed. Now we have a lot to cover in this tutorial, so let's take a look at it. Starting out, let's just take a look at some of the different things we end up with. Here's your sort of standard low poly look you can get, but check this one out. It's almost like a disco ball elephant. Here's some cool camouflage patterning. We will not be tackling any kind of texturing or materials in this tutorial. It's just about creating different polygon layouts. However, I do have some ideas for that for a possible follow-up tutorial. Now this pattern, this is one of the crazier ones. We kind of get this brick type look. It's really smooth and it's also inflated on the characters. That's fun, but I was kind of blown away when I got that one. Here, very crystal looking elephant and character. Next up, this one just sort of messed up low poly look, but I mean, it's really cool and kind of almost creepy looking. Here we go, just another nice one. So many different combinations. Here you can see these edges really getting defined and you could imagine rendering these things out as sketch and tune and possibly just the individual polygons. Here's a smooth out low poly version. Oh, look at this one. It's kind of like the paving again, but I love the flow that we start getting implied on some of the sections on this. This one is just crazy enough where I was like, hey, that's worth throwing in, where I kind of shrunk it down and it still looks kind of like a crystal. And this one, oh yeah, look at that one. You know, like those, those crystal egg shapes you see sometimes? This just reminds me of that type of shape. This one, it's just really weird. Once again, it's kind of like those paving stones, but with little bevels in between. Very neat looking. There you go, just kind of some messed up surfacing. This one looks really neat. I'm gonna hit NA as a shortcut and you see this, this, I don't know, it's kind of like a sketchy look to this. Even the shading, you can see it, it feels like there's some definition to it, so I like that. Just another low poly look, working really well. All of these meshes are the same mesh fed through the processes we're going to be talking about. Now this one, oh, it's so curly. Like and you, the mesh flow they end up getting here is really interesting working on both the elephant and the figure. Over here, uh, this I just absolutely love this type of look where you get this low poly thing. We get all these triangles, but you've also got them smoothing from one triangle to another. It's just like one of my favorite low poly looks. This one, man, I was just blown away when I kind of stumbled across this. I was just playing. And once again, just these weird, weird shapes, just layering up like five different modifiers, five different deformers, and you can end up with this type of look. It's just so much fun to experiment with. And then here we go, jump this out. This was to show that if we were to bring in a character, let's say from Mixamo, we can apply all of this stuff onto it, bake it out, and now we can get an animation from it. So all the different effects that we've been talking about could be baked out and used in different ways. I don't think that Alembic allows for end guns, but besides that, you can see like the effect that we can get and get this playing back in real time, thanks to Alembic, which is just wonderful. There are so many possibilities on this. If you like this tutorial, if you end up making something useful out of it, something cool, a like is always appreciated. Send me a comment too as well for things you'd like to see. If you like this type of thing where I just kind of throw out something sort of technical and I, I want to see what other people make with it. So we've got a lot to cover. So let's jump in proper.
To begin with, we need two different models. One of them is going to be this mannequin model from Mixamo. If you have an Adobe account, you can get access to this and download it. There's other tutorials on the web all over the place talking about how to bring this in the cinema. I'm not going to worry about that as a detail, but I've downloaded this mannequin and a swing dance animation. Click download, you get the FBX. And then in cinema here, I can drag in that FBX. It's already open yet. Yeah, go ahead, make a new one. That's fine. Leave everything default. It's going to take a second to open. It's a pretty big file. And one thing you have to do right away, very important, is nothing can be edited. You see everything's grayed out. And that's because it comes in by default inside of a Cinema 4D take. So all I have to do is go into take, find the Mixamo.com one, select it, file, and then current take to new document. It doesn't look like it, but we've actually jumped into a new document in Cinema and everything has become unlocked. We have access to changing every property that we want inside of this, working quite well. I don't need the material. The reason I use this mannequin model is, oh, didn't delete the material. Looks like I accidentally, I deleted the leg by accident. Delete the material. The reason I grabbed this model is it's actually a single mesh and isn't one that clearly looked like it was a single mesh, even though these blend in, it is one model. And I think that'll just do a good job for giving us something to feed in to the different deformers that we're going to be playing with. Next up, another model that everyone should have access to. We have the content browser and inside of there, you should be able to have downloaded from Maxon your 3D objects, volume one and two. In volume two, we have sculpting base meshes. And I think the elephant is a great model to bring in. And for our purposes, I think a small elephant is even cuter. So E for move, scoot him to the side. Don't need those materials. Don't need, sorry, elephant, but we don't need the eyes. But I would like to plug up these empty eye sockets so that we have a, a mesh that will hold water. And these are the only two holes inside of the elephant. So that should give us a couple different meshes to play with just so we can see the results of different models. One being animated, one coming in very clean from cinema, very low poly. So with that in mind, it's a good idea just to save the scene file. As I said, you can get access to these scene files. I won't be able to include the Mixamo model, but you know how to go and grab that one. Inside of the tutorial scene files, I will save this one as number 1A. Um, that's fine. Start. Let's clean up everything that we don't need here. I don't know what this question mark is, so that is not needed. We've got the elephant base. It's a nice idea to keep the word elephant inside of that. That's fine. And in fact, yeah, I'll create a connect object and put both models inside of it. I don't need the connect to be welding. That's just going to slow things down right now unnecessarily. But this is now going to treat both of our models as a single model. So we can just affect both at the exact same time and see what the end results are going to be. Now, one of the obvious places to start here is using a polygon reduction. Now, there's actually two of them in cinema. There's kind of a secret one. It's the older one. It's actually the one I prefer. But to start out, you can always grab your polygon reduction drop any object inside of it, and it should start reducing those polygons. One of the problems I have with it is that it takes a pretty long time to recalculate. It's smarter, and I think it does a better job of subdividing. It just takes longer. It maintains your UVs better as well, so I want to give it a credit. However, if I hit play right now, you're going to see that it's really slow to recalculate. You can even see a little message here where it's re-triangulating every single time. Now, it's going to have to happen no matter what, but it just doesn't work as well for me here. So, I'm going to say that, yes, this exists. You can tinker with it. I just don't like it as much as the old one. And I really hope Maxon does not get rid of the old one entirely. They have hidden it. It doesn't exist in the deformer menu anymore. You have to hit shift C and search for polygon. And there you can see a purple polygon reduction. That other one, this one is a generator, but this one is a deformer. And it being a deformer, I just think it makes, it just makes more sense for the order of operations. So this shall be, uh, you know, we can even put this in the null. I hit Alt-G, put the connect in the null. And now anything that we put in this null is going to happen just for a visual order of operations. I'll move this after the connect. So that's happening after. Now, right away, I think it did pop up quicker. And if I hit play, you're going to see that these frames are a lot faster. It's already giving us way faster playback than the other one did, which is one of my big reasons for preferring this one. Now, of course, a very basic version of the look here can be just cranking up our reduction strength. 98% is going to be super reduced, and you can see all the polygons have dropped way down, and it's just going to work. We hit play. It should play back even faster, actually, because I think less base points are making their way in. Now, that's using our polygon reduction. It's an obvious thing to do. You probably have played with it before. You kind of know that technique. But how can we push this further? 
Well, one, if you look at the elephant, you see it's actually pretty consistent all the way through. Even as this character animates, the elephant is barely changing at all. His layout, you can see it's kind of popping and changing every time. And I, in some ways, I think that's a good thing. I want this to sort of change every frame. But the elephant's not doing that. What if we want more control over that? Well, one way we could do that is by changing the mesh that's getting fed in before the polygon reduction. You could use a displacement deformer, but even faster to calculate is actually using a MoGraph effector. Specifically, I shall use the random effector. Put it before the polygon reduction. I think it's even kind of cool that they both share a purple color, implying that it can be used as a deformer. So with random selected, we can jump into position and these are pretty small models. So a position on X, Y, and Z of two and two and two, I think should be a pretty good amount. And that should be deforming the original points. In fact, let's take a look and turn it on and off, on and off. Not really seeing anything because we have to go to the deformer, say the deformation point. The instant we do, it's going to explode into all these different polygons and even the elephant changes a little bit. The polygon reduction actually doesn't mind this that much. If we turn it back on again, there are more triangles here because it's messier, so it's having to do more work to... It can't reduce as well because there's not a smoothness to the mesh that it can see, but we, we didn't have to push it that far. The important thing here is let's turn off that polygon reduction. If we were to hit play, this is going to run very smoothly. This does not take very long to calculate. You can see how that mesh has changed, but I want this to change every single frame. I want every frame for there to be some variation. So inside of our random deformer under effector, Currently, it is just randomly generating a, a different value on every point. If we change that to noise, then now it's viewing a big giant cloud of noise to be generating that. If we hit play, we will see the elephant like kind of warbling all over the place. That's fine. What I specifically want though, is every point to be independently calculated. And that's really easy. Just going to indexed and turning that on. And now every point is doing its own thing as if its neighbor wasn't close by it. It's being randomly sampled from some point in space. And now you can see everything is slightly deforming. Not enough for that to see it's looking like an elephant. And our character here has definitely got some deformation slowly traveling through. What this means is what's being fed into the polygon reduction is a little bit different every frame. And so without all those perfect polygons lining up, you can see that every single frame, the elephant is going to refresh in a really cool way where we can control that animation. The faster we set up the random and the more that deforms, the more variation we'll get in the individual points as it refreshes in the polygon reduction. So keep that in mind, but I do like that as a tool for creating extra randomness. Good time to do a quick save right there. Now, that's two of our tools. We have a random deformer and a polygon reduction. Continuing on the theme of using an effector as a deformer, let's create a plane effector. And this time I'll put it, eh, we can even put it before the random effector. Inside of parameter, I don't want this to push out on Y. Actually, let me show you why. Under deformer, if we turn this on as a deformer, as we want to, it's going to kind of explode in every direction. And that is because naturally cinema wants to push out on Z and this is trying to push out on Y. So it's going in a very strange direction. Get rid of it on Y and instead do it on Z. And we should just see the characters inflate just a little bit. We push that as far as we want. But the reason we're turning this on is you'll see that as we reduce the character, they tend to get a little bit skinnier. We're losing a lot of detail. So I have found putting a plane deformer in here and turning it on is a really nice way of getting them to kind of counter inflate and maintain their limbs and details just a little bit more. Only push that as far as you want. Keep in mind, you can push this really far and start inflating the characters to become like huge. Also, you could put in a negative value and really make them you know, super skinny. So a lot of extra control there as well. So now we've got a plane deformer to add to that collection. Another quick save. What is next in the collection? Well, the main one is going to be one of my favorites, and that is the bevel deformer. I was so excited when they added this in the cinema because it adds so much extra power in. Everything that as it's laid out right now is working quite well. We can see all the polygons and the points very cleanly. So this will be the next deformer in order. So it will be the fourth one. Dropping that in, we are modifying specifically the edges here. Now, modifying these edges is how we get to, as I said, my favorite simple visual effect. And that is, let's not worry about limiting the angle of the edges. Turn that off. And every single edge now is getting this bevel applied. I like setting it to an extra subdivision. So you get that little extra corner in the center point. 
taking this entire system now, putting it inside of a subdivision surface. If you hold down Alt, it'll automatically become a parent of it. Now it is smoothing all of that out. I can hit N, A, change our display mode. And now you can see we get this nice, clean, low poly look, these nice, smooth, curved edges on top. So as simple as that, we are able to just build a simple stack and get this look. It's not going to play back quickly, but we can hit play and you can see that this will animate and everything is playing through including a animated character. So that's cool. And you know, all this extra nice fun motion on top of it. Of course, we can start turning on or turning off any of these effects. So turning off this random, it won't completely get rid of it, but this elephant will not be twitching around nearly as much. You see, he's very consistent. Now I don't like it being consistent, as I said. So leaving that on, now he's kind of twitching around all over the place. That is just, ugh, it's such a great little toolbox here. Next up in the toolbox, we'll turn off the subdivision surface. Hit NV so we can see our polygons again. And now inside the bevel, here's another very important tool. We don't need subdivisions, but what we would like to do is not affect the edge of the models. I would like to affect the points of the models. If you haven't played around with changing this mode to points, it actually opens up a lot of possibilities. Right away, you can see this is pretty cool. We're getting these almost like little circles everywhere that the polygons had been meeting which by itself, that could be a cool look. As we start increasing the offset, it's going to dramatically change the look of that. If you start pushing it too far, it will begin to explode. However, we can limit that pretty well by creating, oops, I forgot those go negative. If you middle mouse button, or I'm sorry, if you right click on offset on this little up and down arrow, it will reset it to its default value. Now, if it's going too far, there's a great checkbox here, limit, turn that on, and now it can't push beyond kind of its natural limitation, and it shouldn't really explode. Every once in a while, you can still get a frame where it pushes too far. However, now as I increase this, you can see that the meshes are sort of, well, it doesn't show it too well here, and I'll show you in a little bit, but look at how messed up it is successfully made this mesh. It's super crazy. Look at how messed up this now looks. This has now opened up another opportunity to show, I think, the final deformer that's going to be really useful in this journey. And that is the smoothing deformer right here, smoothing. By grabbing the smoothing deformer, that can be the last one. It's going to calculate after those. This will smooth the results of whatever we fed in. And you see the result of the mesh. Now, stylistically, I don't know if this is something that you're going for, but pay attention to like these really crazy polygons and how smooth that they they are. Now, they're crazy end gons and they're kind of bouncing all over the place, but it's something that we might be able to trace or render individual polygons. This is actually pretty cool. It's pretty exciting. Now, we don't need to push this that far. We Grabbing inside of smoothing, the stiffness could be way higher and you can just transition so it just gets a little bit of that. As I slowly pull this in, you see we get something reasonable, so we're not completely destroying the mesh, and everything gets smoothed out and less exploded. So that's a nice detail. Now, most of this is just going to... I think we've now added every tool that's going to be useful. Just these five different objects. We'll be turning them off, making some duplicates of it, and combining things in different ways, but this is the recipe for creating all those different shapes I already showed you. So let's begin by turning off the smoothing. And you can see we get this crazy shape. Now, what's actually happened is that these little circles, oops, got to be careful. Uh, these little circles slowly grew until they collided with each other, in a sense, almost inverting the mesh. So let's see that a little bit better but by turning off actually pretty much everything. Let's turn off everything. We're back to the original mesh. And let's just take a look at that bevel by itself. When it's really small, actually, this bevel will take a really long time to calculate on all these polygons on this model. So I'm going to, for our own sanity, temporarily take the character out and we're just looking at the elephant. So with the elephant selected, or the elephant being what we're affecting, changing the offset down to one, you see we've got our regular polygons and slowly this square is growing from that point. And as we push that to different amounts, we can start visually getting some really cool effects. Now, currently, the offset mode is set to fixed distance, but something that's pretty cool when you're stylistically, oh, look how cool this pattern looks around the eye. But anyway, in the offset mode, instead of fixed distance, we could use proportional. It's not something I usually use, but in this instance, it's actually great because it's going to relatively scale these based on how large the polygon is. So as the offset percentage is increased, they're slowly going to get closer to meeting each other. So I, you know, I'd argue this is a look that we have. Now you push it a little bit further, 
And once you get to a certain point, it's almost like that look disappears. And I don't even see that anymore as like these little dots in between. Instead, it feels like this really cool alternating kind of like stop sign pattern is very kind of crystalline in the way it's laid out. And man, that's just really neat looking. As you continue to slide this even further, they get really close to each other and you're kind of getting, it almost feels like a reptile type skin, which is pretty neat looking as well. But then pushing it all the way to 100%, the points meet each other and we've almost inverted all the polygons that made up the object. He's, instead of having a mesh flow horizontally and vertically, it is now diagonal in every orientation. And that's pretty neat by itself, just as a model. Now, having done that, keep in mind that each of these were separate polygon, you know, kind of this polygon expanded to there and that one expanded to there, but there's kind of double points on top of each other. So to make this useful to us, we should throw this entire null containing everything, throw that into another connect object, holding down alt. So it becomes a parent. And immediately you can see if I turn this on and off, there's a mesh that's overlapping itself. And here's one where it's re-welded. And this has become a kind of a baked down version of it. And that goes a long way to cleaning that up. Now, having baked that a second time, essentially connected it down so it's a baked down mesh, I can make a duplicate of this bevel holding down control. It'll become a child of that new connect. And to keep it kind of order of operations visually, I shall move the null containing all of our models above it. So this is a second bevel happening after everything else. Now, something that's kind of funny is it's almost like we just did a subdivision surface where it's kind of turned those diagonals back into horizontal lines. Turning this on and off, you can see it's just kind of fixing it, but we've now doubled our polygons. Now, having said that, we don't have to push this all the way. So if I start going a little bit easier on this, then now we have that same pattern, but inverted. And just look at this crazy, like, amazing pattern that we get on top of any model that we put in here. It's really cool. Having done all that, we can turn on and off any other thing that we fed into any part of the system. So what would be nice here? Well, it's re, it's kind of, it's nice to do it kind of step by step. So I don't need this final bevel. And honestly, this one, let's turn that off. But let's go back to making this very low poly. So I'll inflate it again. I think our character can come back in as well. Reinflate it. Let's randomize those a little bit. Do the polygon reduction to whatever degree we want. It doesn't have to be this much. Drop this to 90 and a lot of the original geometry will remain. Of course, the more you reduce it, the quicker these bevels will calculate. So I think this is nice here. Now reactivating that bevel that did a really nice job of inverting is going to give us a very different looking mesh again. In this case, maybe smoothing is nice where you can smooth all those patterns out and now you get this super crazy looking one. But that of course can be baked down by this connect and then reactivating this bevel, I could put another bevel after that one. And now you can see that we're sort of getting these tiles on the character. Almost looks like, I don't know, like he's made of pave, paving stones with like grout in between. Now the bevel, of course, can have extra subdivisions. I can crank up the subdivision by one or two. And you see there's going to be more rounding out of those little in-between pieces. And it's just, I don't know, stylistically, just tinkering around. It's really, it's really, really neat looking. This is just fun combinations. There's no particular, there's there's no right or wrong way at this point. If you do have an effect you're going for, make sure you build it in a very kind of meticulous way. You see, as I'm building, I'm like, okay, what do I want? Let's turn everything off and slowly add the recipe in where, all right, maybe the elephant, I want to have more polygon. So we'll put that into its own subdivision surface. Just subdivide it by one. So it's a little closer to the character. Now that that is happening, uh, let's not inflate them this time, but I do want that randomness. And you see the elephant's more randomized because he has more polys. Then the, do the polygon reduction as far as I want it to go. Maybe that's too much. Maybe a 95 is a good amount. That's pretty good. I like that. Then we can bevel however we want that to be. In this case, I'm thinking, why don't we do a small bevel, a small point bevel, and we can keep it proportional. There we go, something like that. Just these little circles in between each of those. Actually, I'll go a little bit further. Yeah, so oh, you get this nice crystal effect. And I'm digging that. that. That's perfectly fine place to stop if I wanted to. And actually, if you want to kind of keep the low poly look even further, make sure in the connect that's holding everything, that fong mode can be set to manual. And now you can drop a fong tag on that, and this will take over the fong of everything below it. 
So in this case, I can limit the angle to 1%. And now suddenly that low poly look pops way out. Now you can see the end result of that, which is pretty cool. Now that bevel has given us this effect. We could try smoothing it, see if that smoothing does anything. As soon as I turn that on, actually, look at these. It almost looks like they're made of bricks now, even the elephant. And it's following the curvature really well. You get some really cool patterns emerging. It even feels like it's traveling up the arm. It feels like, uh, like a character that's made out of stained glass or something. So that's pretty cool. And that's as much... That's just a little bit of smoothing. We could push that really far and you see it's gonna get really skinny, but just a little bit of smoothing, really making that feel like some paving stones again, some bricks. Having done that, we could say, okay, combine all that into a single, mo actually, we don't even need that connect. It's not doing anything right now. And after this bevel has done its job, I could be like, you know what? I want another bevel. And after all of this has happened, oops, let's make sure it's after, it's at the end. Turn that on. And this time it's on the point and we could do it like that, but let's try edges this time. I don't know what, I have no idea what effect we'll end up with. Uh, I don't want these subdivisions. So let's just do subdivisions of zero and we're doing a proportional offset. I want an absolute one. So I'll do a fixed distance. And now you can see that these are now getting outlined. I want it to be pretty small, 0.25 perhaps. And yeah, now we get these thin lines in between each one of those. And that should, I don't know, make it feel a little bit more, uh, they'll, they'll make those more prominent. Those will stick out more. And if we are outlining these or colorizing them, then this will just pop out as these paving stones, even more than they already were. Now, technically, actually, now I think about it, there is one more effect you could throw on here, a different type of deformer. Turning off this bevel, I do like this brick look. So the last one I'll talk about is let's make a, another deformer. It is, however, under the MoGraph menu, and that is the poly FX, grabbing that one and making that the final one in the calculation. It is going to um, apply effectors to every single individual polygon. You can also, however, just type in a direct number in here. So if I were to say 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9 in the scale, it's scaling independently every single polygon here down into its constituent parts. Now it is doing it, it's doing the polygons and not the end guns. So the end guns went away, but we've really exploded this out and we've made some really cool characters. It kind of looks like the end of Annihilation, that weird character walking around. And man, it's just so cool how these can can get layered and, and just make the craziest looking things. In this case, uh, this character looked kind of neat. I wanted to inflate a little bit. So we'll turn that inflating on. You see the arm comes back pretty well. And why don't we bake this to Alembic as the final step so let's steal the elephant out because it's not really adding anything to it. The, mm, just, just keep it clean. I will turn on this final connect. However, it doesn't need to weld. That welds all the points together. It makes it calculate a little bit slower. I don't want to wait this entire time. So we'll drop this to 90 frames on this connect object, right? Actually, let's see how long it's taking to run. It's probably going to be pretty slow, but if I play, you can see, actually, it's not that bad. You can see that this is playing through. It's not like real time or anything, but it's working in the viewport. But if you want to see it real time, a great way to do it is right clicking on the connect, saying bake as Alembic. It's going to run through this. That's baked. Turn off the entire hierarchy by holding on control. It'll actually turn off all the children. Visually hide that hierarchy. Pull out the baked character, hit play. And now we have that playing in real time as it travels around. So you, you know, a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities, and so many combinations of these layering up a bevel on top of a bevel on top of a bevel on top of something that's really low poly. You just get so much artistic control over what your final mesh might look like. And one last time, you can jump right back to all the different types that I just tinkered with over the course of, let's say, 45 minutes before the tutorial, just trying to make different looks. And I think we actually hit a lot of these as we are going through stylistically, it's just so much fun to be able to make these. And hopefully now, just looking at any one of these, if you look at this, you should be like, oh, I know how that was made. I can recreate that using these tools. And that is the goal. Now, as I said, if you like this content, if it's useful to you, if you make something cool, especially if you get some sort of client work that you're able to use this, I do have a Patreon set up if you would like to support me there. It's deeply appreciated, but it is not necessary. These tutorials and the 
Rocket Lasso Live live streams will be free for everyone. So thank you very much for watching. Make sure you tag me in anything you make. Leave me a comment if you like this type of tutorial and format where I'm just kind of putting out possibilities and I want to see what other people make with them because, I don't know, my imagination goes wild when it comes to the technical side, but I love seeing the beautiful things that people can make. So make sure you you send it to me so I can see it. Otherwise, I really appreciate you hanging out with me and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.